So to get started, I want to kind of introduce to you what we already know and, and tell you that the overreaching goal of our lab is, is, is this question. What can we do to improve the trace mineral status of these calves at the time of weaning? That's the question that we're trying to answer. And so to do that, I want to go over what we already know. We know that weaning is probably the most stressful event that will, a calf will ever incur in its entire life. That permanent separation from the mother. And we know that's true. We also know that stress results in a loss of essential trace elements. Okay, so when an animal becomes stressed, and it doesn't have to be disease or, or, or a pathogenic response, it can be simple management. It can be co-mingling, transportation, weaning, vaccination. All of these things cause an inflammatory response, which is perfectly normal, and during that inflammatory response, the animal liberates trace minerals into the bloodstream to support all of these enzymatic functions. And if they're not used in the enzymes, then they are generally reincorporated in tissue or expelled from the body. So we can always stress animals and see a decrease in trace mineral status. That's something we know. And then we know that calves are generally have inadequate trace mineral status at the time of weaning or marginal trace mineral status. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And we know that trace mineral status is linked to health and performance of those calves when they are in that post-weaning period. So those are the things we know. Now, depending on where you come from in the United States, one or two or all three of these elements are probably limiting in your cow-calf uh, uh, grazing systems. Okay, Just about all of them are, particularly if you're grazing warm season grasses. Generally throughout the summer and fall and almost always in the winter, these will be limiting. Now, let's just talk about those. Copper, zinc, I'm sorry, yes, copper, zinc, and selenium. And I, and I took some slides out here because this is not the real focus in the area, but I want to convince you that they are important for multiple physiological functions. So what you see here is just a pathway that illustrates the strongest antioxidant function in the body in your body, in the body of cattle, and the body of all mammals. And that's the reduction of superoxide anions, you've all heard of those, superoxide anions to water. And that first step is reducing that anion, superoxide anion, to hydrogen peroxide, and that requires superoxide dismutase, which is a copper-containing, copper-dependent enzyme. It's the most important copper-containing enzyme for immune function. And then that next step, from hydrogen peroxide to water requires glutathione peroxidase, which is the most powerful enzyme, antioxidant enzyme in the body, and it's selenium dependent. So I'm going to get into this a little bit further, but those two elements are just critical. Now I just told you that they are often deficient in forages, particularly warm season forages. Now I'm showing you that they work together in the strongest antioxidant function that, that occurs in the body. The other thing that's a problem is they both are strongly antagonized by sulfur. So now you can sort of see a perfect storm coming up. This whole idea with selenium deficiency, it manifests itself in this clinical syndrome that you all know of as white muscle disease. But in the state of Florida, and I hear it around other places as well, we hear this concept called weak calf syndrome. Have you ever heard that? These calves are born, they're otherwise healthy, they just don't have the vigor to get up and suckle. They just have this kind of weak uh, appearance. And we believe that this weak calf syndrome could be related to subclinical selenium deficiency. That's not yet manifest itself to that clinical uh, uh, occurrence of white muscle disease. And so this is one of the areas that we're uh, interested in. And, and you know, if you're here in Colorado or in Nebraska or the Dakotas, you might be dealing with instances of high selenium in your forages. But most of the United States deals with low soil selenium concentrations, thus the forages are low in selenium. It's interesting to note that of all of these essential trace minerals that we're talking about, the plant also requires them. The plant has biological functions for all of them except selenium. There's no need for selenium for the plant to have normal productive growth. And so we call that a luxury accumulator. So the plant will take up selenium depending on the concentrations that are in the soils. So if you look at the uh, western uh, uh, end of the United States, western side of the mountains, or all of the southeast, selenium is very, very low. And it results in low uh, uh, concentrations in the forages. 
But what the animal ends up with, if a marginal or, or clinical deficiency occurs, it's either primary or secondary. Now, the primary deficiencies are quite uncommon, and that's just simply the consumption of inadequate amounts of essential trace minerals. That's a primary deficiency. But what most all of you deal with is the more important one, the secondary deficiency, where they're probably consuming adequate amounts, but they're consuming antagonists that are tying them up. And there's a lot of antagonists that we need to concern ourselves with, and these are some that you probably are familiar with, sulfur, molybdenum, iron, aluminum. I'm not going to go into these individually, but I just want to point out that, that sulfur is by far the elephant in the room. It's the biggest one that's a problem. I hear people talk about molybdenum a lot, and molybdenum can be a problem, don't get me wrong, but molybdenum is not a problem if sulfur concentrations are low. Molybdenum only acts as an antagonist, or I should say a catalyst, to tie up copper. Uh, as long as sulfur concentration, no, it's not really a problem. And sulfur has become more of a problem for two reasons. One, we feed a lot of high sulfur co-products or byproducts, like distillers, grains, brewers' grains, uh, uh, sugarcane molasses, all high in sulfur, and we see that being occurring more and more. Another thing that you might not be uh, as aware of is the, the increasing use of sulfur-containing fertilizers. It's becoming more and more difficult for our smaller, more uh, uh, family-owned rural fertilizer companies to inventory ammonium nitrate as a, as, as a nitrogen source of fertilizer because of the liability issues that go with it. So we see more and more ammonium sulfate being used on fertilized pastures. And it's nothing wrong with ammonium sulfate. It's an excellent source of nitrogen. We use it at our research center as well. But it will cause an accumulation of sulfur in the forages, and it's something to be concerned about. And then high sulfur water. Now, I want to just tell you before I leave this slide, uh, a take-home message. Just because you can smell the sulfur in the water doesn't mean you have high sulfur water. If you ever come and visit me at the research center and stay in the night in our guest house, that water will knock you back in the shower. The sulfide is so bad, but the total sulfur content is quite low. So don't just use your nose as an indicator because your nose can sense hydrogen sulfide in parts per trillion, which the total sulfur content is very low. But you can have high sulfate water, and some of you from the Dakotas and Nebraska know all about that, and you might not smell it at all, and it could be very high. So I just wanted you to know that. So now we have this issue, right? We have forages that are low in sulfur and our cows and calves are grazing them. We have a problem with antagonists, but the biggest problem is intake, okay? And so there's always this concept and all the way up until my pop, uh, we got rid of our cows until that point, he didn't matter what I told him. He believed that if the cows didn't eat mineral, they didn't need it. And if they ate a lot of mineral, well then they must be lacking something, so they must need it. And that is entirely untrue. Cows only have a nutritional wisdom to consume salt. And they will consume salt at the amount to meet and far exceed their sodium requirement. Okay? So if, a cow, if you are feeding a mineral that's formulated for a four ounce a day intake, and the cows are only eating two ounces a day, they're getting cut in half of what they should be getting. It's not because they don't need it. Now, on the other hand, if it's formulated for four ounces a day and they're eating eight ounces a day, you're not hurting the cow, but I always tell my producers, you're, you're creating expensive urine because the cow will just excrete that onto the ground. It, she doesn't need it. And so managing intake is the biggest deal. And intake can be a problem because many of you have other animals eating the mineral besides the cows, right? Deer and elk and wildlife, hogs getting into it. And then you have this issue with, with precipitation loss and spoilage. So there's other types of shrinkage that, that we need to be concerned about. But, but managing intake is by far more important, and I'm getting in now into different ingredients, but managing intake is the most important thing that we can do to help our producers. So in, in, in Florida and much of the southeast, I know this is the case in other states as well, when it gets hot and humid, cows crave salt more and they eat a lot of mineral. So you can see in the summer months, we have very little refusal of, we feed two ounce a day minerals in the southeast often. We have very few refusals. But when you get into the winter months, you can see they refuse a lot of mineral. They just don't crave it during those months. 
And so that's really tough on us because we calve in the wintertime, late fall and winter, and it's a time when the cows just don't crave salt, so they're not eating mineral. And even today, 20 years at Florida, and I tell this story all the time, producers will consistently tell me they must not need it because they're not eating it. So when those calves are born, they're, they're born adequate in these trace minerals. So here's an example of healthy calves at our research center, 150 days of age. They have adequate selenium concentrations in their liver. Very good, over two part per million, dry matter basis. But we look at the time of weaning, 250 days, now they're deficient, or marginally deficient. They're right there. And look what's happening to those calves. They're, they're healthy otherwise. You know, they're out grazing stress-free, but they're right there, marginally deficient in selenium. Now we do a permanent separation from the cow, load them on a truck, and ship them to Amarillo, Texas. I can guarantee you, two weeks later, they're, they're quite deficient. Now, no problem. Those calves will perform very well as long as they aren't exposed to a pathogen stress or a pathogen disorder. But how can we guarantee that? Because as soon as they start eating, they're very efficient to, to replenish their tissue stores, but it's that peri-weaning period that's just so critical that those animals become deficient until we can get them to eat and get them to replenish. So that's the story. I've just told you the whole story leading up to what we're trying to do to solve this problem. I hope that I've convinced you that it's an important problem and that it's one that uh, merits attention.